We have Tara Fela Durotoye. She's a key player in Africa's beauty industry. She runs House of Tara, a well-recognized, clearly, by your claps, a beauty brand that is growing beyond Africa's borders. Tara, would like to invite you up. Thank you. She's looking fabulous. And we also have here Alexander Amosu. Alexander is a serial entrepreneur in the tech, telecoms, luxury space. Uh, just speaking to him earlier on, I said to him, um, I asked him a general question, and he said, you know what, I do so many things, so I'm not even sure what sector you're talking about. But anyway, um, he can certainly teach us a lot about running scalable businesses. So welcome to the stage. And we also have Terry Rhodes. Terry is the co-founder and CEO of Eaton Towers. Eaton Towers builds, owns, and operates 5,000 telecoms towers in five African countries. He's also an active investor and is an advisor to startup companies. So if you want to start a business, you need to see him after this. Terry, please join us on the stage. All right. Now, we were supposed to have one more person in finance, but... Um, that has been taken off. And I think it would have been an interesting conversation to bring in someone from the finance side. Because whenever you're speaking to entrepreneurs and business people, you always want to hear that uh, issue or that um, topic about funding. But anyway, let's kick off. So um, I'll once again say good evening. It is the evening now, ladies and gentlemen, to what I hope will be an exciting panel discussion uh, on entrepreneurship and adapting local dynamics to scale. Now, just a very, very quick story, and I, pr I promise I won't be talking for more than two minutes, personally, because I know you want to hear from um, these great minds on, on the stage. Um, I do a fair bit of traveling in my work, and two days ago, I was in Australia. And um, it was my first time in Australia, and I wanted to go away. I wanted to go home with something that was unique to the country. And not just a random, like, fridge magnet or like, um, you know, the usual things that you buy, like a souvenir at the airport. I wanted something like maybe an outfit or something that was Australian that I would say, oh, look, this is what I bought when I went to Australia. And um, I mentioned this to one of the uh, a local sound guys that I was working with. And he said to me, he said, Didi, you know what? Don't really bother because what you find when you go around different parts of the world, which I have done, which you know, he was talking to him about himself, you find that most products and services, or mainly products perhaps, um, are generally the same. So you're not really going to find, I mean obviously there's, you know, there are a few things that are unique, but you're not really going to find much that is unique. And I thought for a second, I said, you know what, that is so true. And I wasn't going to comment, but then I turned to him and I said, have you been to Africa? And he said, no. I said, you will find that when you come to Africa, everything is unique. Like, we don't have all these big brands that, you know, are rushing into your country. So you can, you can go to Africa, you can buy a you know, dress or makeup or something, you know, that, um, uh, that you take home and know that this is genuinely an African product. And you know what he said to me? He said, wow, now that's an opportunity. That Africa clearly is the one continent that hasn't quite been hit by the effects of globalization. And then I said nothing, but then I thought to myself, if only we could scale our businesses to get to the point where they, they can sit and compete with you know, these big brand businesses. But anyway, the big question of the day really is how do we adapt local dynamics to scale? So in a way that means how do we hold on to the things that make us unique while still appealing maybe to a bigger market or a global market? And this question everybody, everybody wants to know, why is it so hard uh, for uh, big, big name brands who are, pitch, uh, who are pretty much everywhere around the world to make it in Africa? And you know, that fact alone proves to you that having a scalable business in itself is different from having a scalable business that knows how to adapt to, to um, its products to fit into the local market. And I'll give you an example. There are stories about local businesses in India and China that have uh, survived the influx of global players in their fields. Um, in some cases, it may be because they're using a type of a particular uh, local ingredient that um, appeals to the local consumer. But um, in other cases, it could be a made in India, cheap, rugged scooter uh, that was built specifically for the Indian market and for Indian roads. And that's actually a real story because that company, a very small Indian company, managed to push out mighty Honda who were coming to um, India to try and um, uh, manufacture scooters in India. 
So all in all, we are talking about scaling for impact. Why is it so difficult for businesses born in Africa to grow beyond Africa? We were talking earlier um, in the last panel, Mr. Ricky Steen was talking about the music industry. And when he mentioned that fact and said, you know what, I don't know of, of any African um, brand or any African singer that has actually made it out of Africa. And I, I don't know about you, but my heart sank at that moment, because I thought to myself, music is the one thing that we have. It's the one thing that anywhere you go in the world, you'd hear you know, uh, music from Whiskey and David O. So if musicians can't make it, how are business people supposed to make it? You know, why is it so difficult for African businesses to adapt their products to fit into new markets? And even when we're successful at adapting our products, how do we then consolidate um, all these uh, um, different things and different fits into different local markets into one global operation? So anyway, hopefully our panelists will be able to answer all of those for us. Uh, so I shall go straight to them now. And. You know what, I want to start this way, and I'll start with you, uh, Tara. Let me, let me come to the middle. I'll start with you, Tara, because it's, it's interesting to have this discussion, but I think the first thing I'd like you to do, first of all, is for you to define scale. The reason I'm saying that was because when Mr. Uh, uh, Ricky Steen mentioned that comment, um, as I said up there, I thought to myself, I wonder if there are any businesses that, are, that have made it out of Africa. And then the first name that came to mind was Aliko Danguti, but I was like, well, he is a well-known businessman and very successful, most, most successful black man in the world. But he's not really looking to scale outside Africa, and it, it, he doesn't need to. He's working for him. He's fine with where he is. Um, so I guess that is why I want to get your understanding of what scale means for your business in the first place. Um. I think that a lot of times we are so, um, you know, this desire to be to be international in sense, in a sense. When you think about the international brands, let's take Zara for example. Many before you can become international, many times you'll have to first of all conquer this the country where you're from. Um, for you to really say that you're truly global, there's a percentage of your business that needs to be generated from the local market that you're actually from. Um, I think that those brands are created because you've you've earned a brand, you've earned a name, you've heard consistency in your local market, and then you can then take them further beyond the borders. Um, for us in Africa, I give, use the House of Tara for, as an example, Nigeria is a huge market. Um, and the truth of the matter is that it's only now that we're beginning to see the interest of what Africa, essence of Africa in other parts of the world. So why would I waste my time trying to find um, new markets when I haven't, I'm not yet in Angola. I'm not yet in, in South Africa. I'm not yet in Gabon or, uh, or Cote d'Ivoire. These are markets that understand my product, attract to the Nigerian, ni the, what Nigeria is and the essence of Nigeria. These are the markets I should be focused on expanding into right now. So for me, scale is scaling into markets that are already ready for me. Perfect answer. It makes a lot of sense. Alex, for you? Um, I'm actually kind of go the other way. <laughs> so, I know, I know. Um, uh, for me, um, thinking about businesses in, in Europe or in the UK is not really where my, my focus or energy is at. Um, so I've, for the last four or five years, I've been looking into the African space and focusing on how can I penetrate that market and actually build a business sustainable in Africa. Um, so one case study uh, a couple of years ago, I bought um, the license for OK Magazine. And um, buying the rights for OK Magazine was very expensive, but I thought, well, if I'm going to go into Africa, let me not buy a name that nobody knows. Let me just buy something that it's quite, um, quite, quite, quite known. So we bought OK Magazine, and then we went into Nigeria. We got the license for exclusive uh, for Nigeria. And when we launched, it was a great who are because, you know, OK Magazine is coming to Nigeria. Oh, great, you know. But the challenges that I faced was um, being able to print locally because the quality of the magazine wasn't the same as printing in South Africa or China or, or Britain. So I had to deal with the issue of importing um, copies into the country. Um, distribution, there wasn't sort of like a W.A. Smith <laughs> that I could sort of put the magazines through. So in Nigeria, it's hawker, so you have to find a distribution point where you can sell the magazines um, through people who are going to carry on the streets and sell it through all the cars, et cetera, et cetera. And then um, the other challenge I faced was after the guys in the street collect the money, 
um, it takes them almost three to six months before that money actually gets to me. Um, so that was a quite interesting scenario, trying to launch a magazine in a territory where there's so many different issues that you might not anticipate. Did it work out in the end? I ended up selling the magazine. <laughs> um, because um, the, the, the frustration that I had was on many fronts. Um, I think one was me not understanding the challenges that were within that territory and thinking that it's the same as you know being having a magazine in the UK. Um, and obviously having that magazine, I learned a lot in terms of partnering up with other magazines and realized that actually the magazines locally, when they distribute their magazines, they're not actually thinking about the revenue they're making through um, the guys who are hawking it. It was through advertising that their key f um, um, expenditure comes from. Um, but, but, when inter I but interestingly, that hasn't uh, uh, deterred you from doing business on the continent. Oh, absolutely not. I think, you know, for me, um, Africa is home. Africa is where I'm looking to um, retire at. Um, and for sure, if, you know, if, I'm, I, if I can be successful uh, in the UK, I, I'm damn sure going to be successful in Nigeria, for sure. Um, so, um, no, it didn't deter me at all. In fact, we now have up to 25 brands that we sell across the whole of Africa, um, from New Era, Creative Recreations, Case Swiss, Timberland um, uh, Boots, um, and the list goes on. Um, so I, for me, you know, if you can crack the African market, the rewards are much bigger than you would in Europe. And that's the reason why I focus so much on Africa. Terry, do you agree with that point that, you know, if you can crack Af Africa, then, you know, the rewards are bigger? And also, what does scale mean to your business? Yeah, thanks. That is actually a great point, um, that if you can crack it, the rewards are bigger. But people think the risks are even bigger, and I think it's that gap between risk and reward that I've spent most of my career um, living in. Um, because the infrastructure business that I'm in, the telecoms infrastructure, first with running and building mobile phone companies, uh, with Mo Ibrahim across 16 countries in Africa and then subsequently building our own tower shared infrastructure business so far only across five countries. Um, this is by definition a capital intensive and scale um, business so each, com each of those companies has raised more than a billion dollars and invested it in Africa in assets that are cemented into the ground, that are there long term. It's not extractive, it's not quick buck. This is a long term infrastructure play. So the challenges were persuading people who had the money that we had a good idea that would work in Africa. Um, so as I say, it was about that balance of risk and reward. Um, and you know, plenty of people at the beginning would say, you're mad, there's no money there. And, you know, one sense that kept out the competition, you know, that limits the number of people who are prepared to do it. Um, but there are, as you hear, great opportunities there if you can um, understand and exploit them. Scaling them um, a lot in our uh, industry is about credibility, about personal credibility to get people to back you. Um, that comes from years of experience of working, particularly in our case, for people who are now our customers, in some cases owning companies that are now our customers. Uh, but um, it is achievable, it is possible. We can sit outside Africa and bring the money in. That's largely what I've done. It's mainly US, European money, some South African money. Um, and bring it and put it into solving some of the infrastructure problems in Africa. All right. Now, um, I just, it's interesting that um, in some way, uh, Tara and um, Alex, you are sort of on opposite sides. We're not really. You, you both want to invest in Africa. Um, sorry, uh, do business in Africa, and you both see uh, you know, the opportunities there. But from where I'm sitting, and I'm not, I'm not going to lie, and honestly, this might not make me very popular, but uh, Tara, like, I've, I've, I've done a few things in my, in my short life. I've, I've sort of gone from being an, um, a chemical engineer to being an investment banker to selling properties to being a journalist. Um, and the one thing that I haven't seemed to be able to achieve is be a businesswoman, to be an entrepreneur. It's so hard to do business in Nigeria, or in Africa in general. Uh, business is hard in itself. It's one of the craziest things you can do. But then to do it in a continent that does not provide favorable conditions for you to do it is even crazier. So from where I'm sitting, and I'm going to be very honest, if I had the opportunity to do a business like yours, Tara, what I would do is I would probably do it here. 
let me, let me not lie. I would do it here, yeah? And I'm sure a lot of people here think the same. And not everybody feels like, you know, how I feel. I would do what Alex did. I would make my money here, do the business here, then enter Africa and show off with my products. Now, there's a clothing brand, uh, um, a Nigerian clothing brand. You won't even know it's, it's, it's Nigerian. I can't even remember their name, but I'm sure you girls here know it. It, it sells in Topshop. Um, Virgo's Lounge. Now, Virgo's Lounge is owned by a Nigerian, uh, two Nigerian girls. When that brand started, when I was living in the UK a few, many years ago or so, not that many, but um, Virgo's Lounge were just a small brand in, you know, that, I, uh, that I discovered in Topshop. I didn't even know they were Nigerian. Now, there are a lot of fashion brands in Nigeria, many, loads of fashion brands. But believe me, Virgo's Lounge is probably doing better than most of them are, are doing today. Uh, I might be wrong. Maybe some of you know them personally. Because some, <laughs> some people are shaking their heads, but it certainly looks like they're doing better. So from where I'm sitting, if I was going to do Tara's business, I will do my business from here and then enter Niger um, uh, Nigeria. So Tara, please prove me wrong. I, I think that the beauty space in the, in the US and the UK are very saturated. I will come here and be competing with Mac and competing with uh, Charlotte Tilbury. I'll be competing with uh, Rimmel and competing with Sleek. These are the brands. In Nigeria, I'm a superstar. You are. Yes. <laughs> first of all, first of all, you're a woman. That makes you number one star. Then secondly, you are you built a business using providing a solution to us women in Nigeria. You are Nigerian. We know you. We know you as a Nigerian. And then secondly, you're doing, and you've been doing this consistently for nearly 20 years. I will come here and become, um, what's that expression? Small fish. In, a small yeah. fish. In Nigeria, was House of Tara is still the number one biggest, right, local brand. So when Mac comes to Nigeria, they first of all come to find out what is House of Tara doing and how can we differentiate ourselves. If I was in the UK, I'll just be one of the numbers. You probably wouldn't even know my brand. Um, and, and I think that um, Rick had said something about, about those sort of issues, right, when, when you're still, you're, you know, Africa as a whole is still hasn't gained acceptance. Now, on the other hand, when I go into Kenya, right, and go into other African countries, other Africans are excited about Nigeria, they're excited about what Nigeria has to offer. I'll rather go to a place where I'll be celebrated and go into a place where I'm going to be condoned. And, and for me, Africa is where it is. I'm excited to be there. I'm happy to go to Ghana and see how our products are being accepted. I'm, I'm happy to go to Congo and see how our products are being accepted, rather than come to the UK or the US and does, compete. Does that mean you have no interest in, in, in growing outside Africa? No, I have interest because, obviously, the, the, the uh, African market is also growing, the diaspora, right? So the Nigerians who are coming to Lagos and they're only buying their eyebrow pencils when they come on holidays, and then they're asking their, their mothers to buy and bring to them for London, to London. These are people that we still want to offer service to. But I, I think that they're, they're still a small number compared to the millions of Nigerians and Africans. Um, and I would rather focus on developing infrastructure, retail infrastructure within the continent and, and than to spend that time going into the UK or the US. Now, I could actually, yes, I think she deserves a round of applause for that. <laughs> I could actually, in some way, ask you the same thing, Alex, but, you know, I heard you saying yes, yes, so you were agreeing with everything, even though I took your side initially. <laughs> so, at first, I was like, I'll do it how Alex did it, but then you were saying yes, yes, to what Tara was saying. So, what I'm going to ask you now is, um, given that you were saying yes, yes, um, look, looking at all the businesses that you have done in the UK that you've been very successful at, now, imagine if you had to do that in, Niger in, in Africa. Would you exchange places and do what you did in, in Africa? Would you have started your business in Africa? 100%. Why not? Do you no. think you would have been as successful? I'll be successful wherever you put me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I see um, the potential and challenges in Africa as a business opportunity. Um, you know, when I talk about the issues that I faced with the magazine, those were le learning lessons for me to think about how could I create a solution for those challenges and then sell it to my competitors. It wasn't, oh, I was doing a magazine, I failed at it, I sold it and ran. It was actually, let me test the market, let me look at the holes and how can I plug into those holes so when I come back, 
I'm stronger. And that's the way I see business in Africa. So um, that's why I agree completely about, you know, all the things that you know, were said that for me, when I look at, um, you know, launching brands into the in, into a particular territory like Nigeria, all those challenges basically needs a solution. And those solutions are opportunities for either local business or international business to create a business out of. And then you have a solution. And yeah. that's, that's how I see it. And I mean, I know, you know, you've, you've given us an example of what you've done with um, OK Africa. And I know that you have other brands that, you know, you have quite a lot of interest in Africa um, now, or perhaps in the last three to four years. But you know, you've been doing business for much longer than that, and you've been making some big money. And we've been seeing your name in you know all the papers, but you haven't really um, done much in Africa, you know, before the past three years ago. You're so right. in some way, were you running away from us? <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely not. I think um, you know, as an entrepreneur, you you always have to think, um, how can I do the next big thing? So um, there's only so much in terms of the businesses that I own that I can go in the UK. You know, I think for me, even though I was born here, I think there's a glass ceiling. Um, so as much as my business can be successful and can be great, I know that if I'm in Africa and I did the exact same business, I could really conquer Africa on a different level. Uh, and this is where, you know, if you look at Aliko Dangote and doing cement and sugar and whatever he is, you know, he pretty much is conquering Africa in a sense. Um, you know, again, probably what you guys know me for is the ringtone industry and starting the, the mobile ringtones. And when I started that, um, I remember selling in the UK and then having companies, uh, telecom companies in you know, uh, America, um, Spain, Italy, all hiring my services to sell my ringtones. But just imagine if I actually started that in Africa and I was selling across 54 countries um, through all the telecoms over there, I'd make much more money than I made you know, yeah. doing it over here. So um, the potential is different. And my psyche right now is about, you know, I'm getting older, I want to go back home. In fact, to live the rest of my life in Nigeria. What can I do to create wealth for me in yeah. that particular territory? And that's why I'm so focused about Africa. Fantastic. Now, Terry, you have a lot of experience uh, doing business uh, in Africa, across a number of, of uh, countries in Africa. So perhaps you could tell us a little bit more about that experience. And also, um, I want to tap into this because whenever we talk about the challenges, you know, businesses in Africa face, you know, why they can't scale, we start bringing all the usuals, you know, the, um, unfavorable conditions. It's the government's fault. Um, you know, they're not. You know, there's not enough infrastructure. But there's also that reputational you know, challenge, which I think is huge in itself. So just that idea, I mean, you heard me say, even me, I live there, and I was saying I will run away. You know, talk less of people that are, are you, know, you know, live in, in the UK and live outside Nigeria, you know. So um, what is your, what's your take on that a reputational challenge? Thanks, yes. Um, I've chosen to invest only in Africa for the last 20 years. Um, so I've got no business in the UK, but a small head office, which is an overhead, no revenue. All the revenue and all the investment goes into Africa. So um, one of the perspectives... I want to be like you. <laughs> yeah, well, hold on, though. One of the perspectives I have on scale, and for this company I decided this, is that Nigeria was actually too big for my company. I was, you know, there are very large companies in my sector competing there already. It was a billion dollar entry ticket into Nigeria. I went there, I looked at the opportunities, I came back, I said, look, I'd rather put that billion dollars across five other countries, Ghana, Burkina, Niger, um, Kenya, and Uganda, which is what I've done. So, you know, there's different perspectives on scale, right? For me, Nigeria at this stage was too, too big, big a one to go. Um, it wasn't reputation. Um, it was simply, as we're dealing with, you know, the issue of scale. The step up from where I was operating to Nigeria at this time was just a bit a, a, a big step too far. Um, so this is also about choosing your target markets. Yeah, which is also about, to some extent, what you were talking about. Um, you know, in terms of government, in terms of ease of doing business, in terms of the macro politics. If you're a really long-term investor. Um, you have to be able to see through all of that, uh, and you know, that is part of the approach to reputation. But also, local local management. You know, we we have entirely local management in our um, operations, and the availability of um, skilled and trusted local management is a, a real key to be able to operate long term into each of these countries. And that's where you build your reputation. It's to everybody that works for you in, the, in, in each of the countries. 
Um, so that's where we invest the time and the money. It's not, you know, it isn't just about money. It's very much about the people and managing that reputation, as you say. Yeah. Mm. I'm just gonna um, take a, a question from the audience. I, I, I mean, I do want to follow up um, from what you were saying, Terry. But this is a question for you, Tara. It says, "What is the scope for e-commerce to scale your brand for the diaspora audience you spoke about?" So, in other words, you know, you have this, you know, these customers here. The, you know, the diaspora. They want to buy your your brand, but many of them can't buy it on, on online. You know, or, or can they? So yes, you can you can buy um, the tire product online. We have a, um, an e-commerce website. Um, if you went there and you ordered, the only challenge is that usually um, people would have to have experienced the brand first of all, right? Uh, sometimes, many times you see the e-commerce works um, with brick and mortar. So you've experienced the product before in the stores, and then you are then asking, oh, I want to buy a foundation, and you already know your shade. I think that's one of the challenges we're going to be having with, with, um, with the diaspora um, customers. But we do have a website where you can purchase the products from. All right, um, Terry, I just want to continue from where you uh, left off. So you gave us uh, insight into you know, the business that you do um, in Africa, but perhaps you could talk about the challenges that come with doing business in all these different local markets and just how different uh, or how similar they are. Um, it's both similar and different, I think. So we've taken a model that has worked around different parts of the globe and brought it into Africa, but the conditions that you're working under, particularly the logistics, and as you heard even from the president of Ghana this morning, the power is a major, major difference as far as we're concerned. So, you know, I don't want to spend 40% of my money on power, but I have to because the um, electricity supply, I mean, he didn't mention they put the prices up 50% the year before, they cut them 35% or the fact that it costs twice as much in Ghana per unit of electricity as it does in Kenya. You, know, you have to adapt to those kind of local conditions. It means I've got to build solar panels in Burkina Faso and Niger and in the desert. That's fine, that's how you adapt the, the, the international model to the specifics of uh, the logistics and the power and other characteristics of Africa. Um, yes, it means that costs are higher, um, but everybody understands why. So, you know, it's not there because if you, uh, if you can engage with your customers so they fully understand what you're doing and why, then they're being prepared to pay for it. And I think that applies across all the sectors. You might face bigger challenges, but it can translate into bigger opportunities. I think that was the point I heard from everybody here. Now, um, Alex, you know, you know a lot about tailoring your you know, products that you're selling to fit the needs of, you know, different uh, customers, particularly in the luxury uh, space. Uh, so tell us exactly, give us an insight into that experience. Um, so, um, you know, one of the things that I like to do is wake up and, and, and think of something that nobody's done before and find a customer who's prepared to pay uh, a lot of money for it. So, um, when um, I went into the luxury mobile uh, phone industry, it was actually by, by accident because a friend of mine bought um, his wife a Virtue mobile phone, which is a very expensive uh, customized phone, and um, his wife couldn't use it. So he knew that I was uh, somebody who was in the mobile field and asked, look, she has a Samsung phone. Could you create something that looks like a Virtue for her? And you know, when you're an entrepreneur, you just say yes, <laughs> and then figure it out later on. So um, I spent about um, three weeks dismantling this um, Samsung B900, which I, I can remember vividly. Went to Height and Garden and got them to uh, create the plastic front cover and the back cover in solid 18 karat gold, which took about five or six attempts to get it perfectly right. Um, and then I went to another jeweler's and got them to encrust diamonds all over it, um, and then put it all back together, went to another shop, bought a nice, beautiful box, uh, and took it back to the client, who nicely paid me 20,000 pounds for this diamond across the D900. Um, and then he gave it to his wife for a birthday present. Now, if I told anybody in this room before I started that idea that I was gonna get a normal phone that cost 200 quid, and crossed it with diamonds and gold and sell it for 20,000 pounds, you guys will say I'm bloody mad. Um, but I sold it, um, and the client um, obviously gave it to his wife. His wife was very, very happy. She went around to all her friends and said, look, I've got the only diamond, beautiful, 
Samsung in the world. Her, their friends got jealous and they had Blackberries and they had iPhones. So my phone started ringing. Um, and with other people asking me, can I get my Blackberry done in diamonds? Uh, how much would it cost? And literally I created um, a mobile luxury business from selling very, very expensive high, high uh, price phones to rich people who wanted something different from everybody else. Interesting. And you know, I'd like to tap onto this question that's coming from the audience. Uh, uh, it says, uh, Alexander, do you think that um, you would move away from luxury products into other products that are more need-based if you were to conquer Africa? So you talked about how um, you, know, you feel that you, you know, you'll be a success ever, you know, anywhere, but I don't think that many people, I'm not saying that Africans don't like luxury, we do like luxury, but there's probably less people that can afford to put you know, diamond on a, on a Blackberry when they're still oh, trying to pay for, pay, pay for diesel and school fees and all those things. Um, uh, well, that's a stereotype. <laughs> um, um, there are lots of wealthy people in Africa. Um, yes, there are a, a very small minority in terms of if you take Nigeria, for instance, maybe you could say 5% of the overall uh, numbers are super ultra wealthy, and then you have the middle class, et cetera, et cetera. Um, no, um, to answer that question, um, I'm very passionate about the luxury market. That's what I get my excitement and enjoyment. I never do a business that I feel that um, I, I feel that I wake up one morning and think it's work. I always wake up in the morning and think, oh, this is great. This is not job. This is, a, this is just something fun. So, um, the luxury market in across Africa is part of my sort of target base. We are already uh, investing heavily in buying luxury brands into uh, different parts of Africa, and we'll be launching those brands um, over a period of um, years when the African market is a little bit more developed. Because if you look at Nigeria, there are some brands in there, um, but there isn't sort of like an Oxford Street or a um, you know, yeah. or Bond Street. So you almost have to wait for time period to, to hit that mark and then you say, oh, somebody says, I want Gucci. Oh yeah, I have Gucci. And I'll, you know, you can now buy it from me to then launch a Gucci store. So that's what we're working towards. That's yeah. what we're yeah. kind of creating. Some people might argue though and say that, um, you know, in spite of everything that you've said, and yes, there are wealthy people um, on the African continent. I know that's not really the topic of discussion for today, but then some people might actually come back and say, but wealthy people in Africa don't like buying, well, you know, expensive products in Africa. They'd rather buy those products outside Africa. Yeah, but you're, you're, you're probably very right, and I think so. I think for now, that is the case. But I think, you know, like with any, if you look at the Asian market, if you look at the Chinese market, the Middle Eastern market, when you create an environment that feels exactly the same as you shopping in, in the UK or anywhere, in Europe, then people will shop there. Right now, what we have, uh, and I might be, you know, uh, a bit yeah. crude in saying this, is people are creating homes and converted that into a luxury apartment. That's not what they're used to when they come over and shop in Harrods or Selfridges. Mm -hmm. So once we get to that level, I think in, you know, if you, classic example is South Africa. They have all the uh, luxury stores and uh, boutiques and malls out there, and people in South Africa are not jumping on planes to come to UK to buy a Louis Vuitton. They're buying Louis Vuitton exactly in South Africa. So once we adapt that same principle in the other uh, West African countries, um, then we'll see more increase in people buying locally. Okay, and um, Tara, I, I, I wanted to ask you um, this. Uh, we've talked about some of the challenges you know, that come with running businesses in Africa in general, um, but what about the challenges in itself that come with uh, actually adapting your products you know, to fit into some of these local um, uh, markets, even if it's you know, African markets that you, you, know, you want to expand into? Do you face challenges with that in itself? Yes, definitely. Uh, first of all, um, we know that it's, uh, transportation across the continent is difficult. Uh, to move from Lagos to Gabon, you have to go to Togo uh, to be able to arrive in Gabon, right? And that's after you've stayed at the airport for about three hours. So those are some of the issues that we face. But in terms of the, qu the quality of the product or the color combinations, so there are some things that are similar and there's some things that are different. Nigeria is a more advanced market in terms of makeup. Nigerians love makeup and we love makeup a certain way, okay? Uh, and there's almost like a way of doing makeup in Nigeria. Absolutely. There's also a way of doing makeup in Senegal that is different from the way makeup is done in Nigeria. Oh, wow. Yes. And then, and they like makeup as well, but it's different, in a different way. Then there's Kenya, who like makeup, but in a very light and almost not their way even though that's already beginning to change, thanks to Nollywood. <laughs> um, and so, if you go into the East Africa, the, kind, the shades that you 
that you would find are shades that may not sell in Nigeria. Uh, and the reason why is because just the complexions are different. So as much as we are similar, we're still yet different. And uh, so there are certain trends that will do well in Nigeria, they probably wouldn't do well in Kenya. So for example, we went through a, a trend of glitters in Nigeria, where glitters were put on the eyes and also on the lips. That trend didn't hit in Kenya, probably wouldn't, right? Um, so, so those are some of the things that we see. So when we're taking in products into the cities and training the people, we think about these the, the differentiators, but also the things that make us similar. I was, I mean, I I was going to say to you, so how do you then, you know, change your business strategy? And, you know, with training, it must be a nightmare, you know, obviously if you have, I, mean, I know you have 5,000 sales reps, yes. for example, you know, you're trying to change, you know, train all of them to, you know, do it in Nigeria, but then you want to grow and expand, but they do make up in a completely different way in other countries. I, I, I think that, that this is one of the reasons why international brands don't do very well in Africa. And this is the reason why it's because many times you're thinking there is a way of doing business. And because we are front Franchising our model, we insist on it being the same way when we arrive in that city. Um, collaborations, how do you work with locals? Um, locals will tell you, um, this is okay, this is not okay. What sort of collaborations are you having? Um, finding the best franchise partner, right, within the locality, who already knows the market. So for example, I, I remember when L'Oreal came into Nigeria and they, they wanted to distribute Maybelline. They asked themselves, can we as L'Oreal distribute Maybelline? No, yes, we distribute in Brazil, but we can't distribute in Nigeria because Nigeria is awkward. I mean, um, my brother, just uh, Alexander, just talked about that. For example, House of Tara, has, we have to build our own retail si system. So he was talking about luxury where there's no Bond Street or what have you. For a long time, we didn't have shopping malls. But I was selling makeup, and I've been selling makeup for 20 years. Shopping malls only came into Nigeria maybe in the last 10 years. So prior to 10 years, what was I doing? Like he said, converting residential homes, right, into retail homes. And that was a way of solving a problem. Um, the Nigerian women like makeup, yes. How am I going to make it available to everyone in Abuja, in Kaduna, in Lagos? It's by converting residential homes to retail homes, and that's what's, what has happened. That is going to change, it's already changing now, uh, because now we're having more malls, people are buying, building more shopping complexes where you can now, you can almost have like a Oxford Street, not an Oxford Street, but a street that is majorly retail, um, not as flamboyant as Oxford will be, but it's seemingly a retail space, and that's changing now, and we're beginning to adapt, and I think, to encourage people who want to start business in Africa. The reality of the matter is that anywhere you're going to be, this is going to be tough, right? Um, the question is, am I willing? The, the risk versus what I'm going to gain from it. And I think for us, it's taking that and, and, and embracing it and, and being happy that we're doing so. All right. I just want to yeah. quickly touch up upon what you were saying about, because when we bought the OK license, um, one of the things the, um, the OK um, owners said, we, we must have Katie Price in the magazine. And I was like, <laughs> um, well, this is OK in Nigeria. Who the hell is going to know about Katie Price? You know, they had their own pre pre uh, directions of what they wanted in terms of you know content. Um, you know, so literally we had to rewrite the whole rule book, and eventually it became um, what we thought would be um, uh, would work locally. But obviously, with the content owners, it was a bit um, for, for for OK. That's not the direction they wanted. They wanted it to be more sort of British, and that doesn't fit with the territory. And 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 even though I had challenges um, locally in Nigeria, then you also have challenges with the owners who have their own pre prescribed um, mentality, thinking that it's going to work the same as it works in the UK. And so you have to balance those two things. So eventually, we just had to kind of move, move. I know Terry, you want to say something, but you know what that says to me? That almost uh, sounds like, it, it seems like it's even more difficult for bigger brands or established brands to actually adapt to the way things are done in local markets. And it's actually easier for smaller brands. Well, if you don't understand the market, you're going to fail. It's, it's really that simple. It's not rocket science. Mm. Um, for us, it was very important that we understand what the consumer wanted. Yes, there were some challenges in terms of distribution, pricing, um, and recouping your, your money and taking your money out of the country was also, um, uh, at some point, some You want to take your money out of the country? <laughs> well, I've got to pay suppliers. <laughs> the profits for me stays there, but the, to, pay, to, pay, to pay suppliers, um, you know, to print the magazine, I've got to pay the suppliers. So that becomes a, a challenge as well. But for me, all these challenges are quite exciting, you know, because, you know, when we didn't, couldn't find, the, um, obviously, the right printers um, to print in terms of quality, I started thinking about, okay, who can I partner up with to actually create a printing firm in Lagos to print 
the exact same quality because that's a business in itself. Um, in terms of distribution and having the, only the hawkers being able to sell, perhaps we could create, like they do over here, a distribution system across the whole of Nigeria, delivering magazines from Kano to Abuja to Lagos. So I wouldn't say to anyone in this room that's thinking about going into Africa as, oh, there's lots of problems, you know, there's lots of challenges. Actually, those challenges are business opportunities for you to turn into a profit. That's the way I see it. All right, and Terry? Yes, thanks. It's a different sector, but the same philosophy. You know, how do I compete with an American company 30 times the size? Mm -hmm. The answer is they've got a way of doing business that they try and impose on yeah. the countries, right? They happen also to operate in India, they allow no cross-fertilization between their African and Indian businesses because they're in different silos, right? I went to India and recruited the chief operating officer because I thought this guy knows about how to do things on the ground in a way that's much more similar to the problems I'm facing in Africa. Um, so, you know, don't assume that you can't compete with these guys. Their own, their own size is also a weakness. Um, and I think that's what we've heard yeah. collectively yeah. here, you know, across different sectors and different countries. Yeah, but in spite of that, Terry, um, there's an example. Uh, I, I know, you know, you, you operate in five African countries, but you used to operate in six African countries. So you were in South Africa, but then you were, and I'm sorry to say, make it sound this way, but you were pushed out by a, a bigger brand um, in South Africa. So did you not do your homework well in that case? No, no, it was, it, it, that was the big American company that I mentioned. So, <laughs> so we started from, from nothing and built a business in South Africa. They were already there. We were trying to position for a scalable opportunity in South Africa um, that hasn't come. So with what we still regarded as a subscale business, we decided that if there was a chance to take a profit and reinvest it somewhere else, which is basically what we did, we sold them the business in South Africa and put the money in other countries on the continent. Um, that's also, uh, you know, you've got to time your entries and exits. If you get a good opportunity to make some money and reinvest it somewhere, then you know, there's no um, sentiment. I don't have a home country in Africa, right? So I'm dispassionately allocating resources around the continent. Um, uh, and that's, again, a different perspective than somebody in one country trying to expand and scale beyond it. And, and sorry, just yeah, quickly yeah, on, touch yeah. on the, uh, what he said. Um, this is Africa. You know what I mean? So, you know, um, there are going to be um, people who are not going to be happy for you to come into their space and threaten that. Uh, I'll give you a class of just sharing some, some, some old news. But, you know, when I was um, shipping um, the OK Magazine into Nigeria, I think some of the um, competing magazines obviously heard about um, OK Magazine coming in. Um, so I get a phone call from the customs in Nigeria saying, um, yes, sir, um, you know that um, we need to release your um, magazine from customs. Though it's gone through several times without an issue, somebody from my competition had paid the customs to not release my magazine, and therefore I need to pay the customs to unrelease my magazine, which meant that I had to pay twice the fee that I would normally to release the magazine. So just be prepared that, you know, when you're going to a particular territory where there's their ways of doing things, you might be stepping on a few people's toes, but it's still exciting nevertheless. So there's sharks everywhere, right? Um, now, I know your questions are coming through, and I encourage you and urge you to send them through, but remember that we're talking about scale um, and um, you know, scaling for impact. Uh, there is one here, though, that I'm going to uh, bring up, and it says, how do you deal with the asymmetric relationship with information within Africa where perhaps you lack the local knowledge to make those initial steps? So in other words, I assume you're saying that um, the fact is we don't even know how to start business in Africa because you're not teaching us how to start business, right? Um, so how do we get the knowledge to make those initial steps I have my views on that, but I'll ask uh, Tara to answer that. Um, I think, uh, from what I understand from the question, um, if you're coming from uh, international, I would say you need to look for local partners. I think local partnership is very, is very important um, because um, as much as we can advise and, and, and speak and, and you know, share our views, depending on the industries that you are in, there may be some issues. So for example, what Alex just said, I may even say to him that it probably wasn't even the competitors who called customs. Customs just told you that. Yes, because customs wanted to make double. Wanted so to make true. money off you because you didn't give them the first place. Um, and so sometimes that sort of information, if Alex told me that, I may say to him that it wasn't even your, 
if you just check. And that's just based on experience, okay? Um, so for me, I think that it's local, it's collaborating with, with locals um, to, who already know the market. Um, but you need to also do that research properly. I mean, I know a few uh, people who have built strong brands in, in Nigeria. And if someone said to me, I'm international coming to Nigeria and I want to work with so-and-so, I could easily tell you that this is a good collaboration, this is a good partnership, this is a partner who understands the Nigerian market and is able to help you. And so I think that research, that the time, the time we need to spend in researching um, is finding who is the right partner. And I think that's one of the most important things that one has to do. Secondly, there's business schools in Nigeria, in, in Africa. Whether it's LBS, whether it's start, start more in Kenya, or it's uh, WITS in South Africa, these are business schools. Stanford uh, University just created a seed program which is really helping uh, African businesses to scale um, because they want to help them to solve, solve more bigger social issues. That's Stanford seed programs have centers in Ghana and in Kenya and, and they're also in India. So we, if we research enough, we'll find enough information that can help us. I agree. There's a lot of research out there. I was, you know, was going to say that. There's lots of things on the internet these days that were not there in the days when Tara started her business. So if she could have done it, you know, with the little that she had, then I always say to the next generation, I know I look like I'm in the next generation, uh, but literally there's just so much. There's just so much opportunity there for them. The fact that they have the internet, you know, most of us didn't have that when, I don't want to say growing up because I sound like an old woman, but yeah, when we were like, in our teens or you know, in universities. But anyway, um, I just want to bring you in, um, Alex, because I know that what um, Tara is talking about is what you do. So you are that local partner. So you guide uh, brands that want to come into the African region. So perhaps you could just give us examples of the type of advice that you've given um, to some of these uh, clients of yours in regards to the way they can adapt their products to fit into um, the African market. Um, I actually, I, I do it the other way, strangely okay. enough, because um, obviously I'm a businessman. So uh, I'll give an example of when I did the uh, Timberland deal. Um, so um, sitting now with the Timberland execs and the owners, and we're talking about they want to go into Africa, they're already in South Africa, um, they're thinking about the Nigerian market, and obviously I said, look, you know, I can help you with that. You know, um, I can take um, Timberland into Nigeria and Ghana, so you know, I'll sign the rights to to um, these two countries. So they said, oh yeah, great, fantastic. So they slap a massive uh, big bill on top of it. And I straight away start saying, look, you know, in Nigeria, there's, uh, you know, as you know, corruption, there's uh, arm robbery, there's, uh, you know, all the things that they would normally say to me, I basically said back to them and basically got the fee reduced by 60% uh, oh, of wow. the value in order for me to sign the deal to then go into Nigeria. But that, that said- That's spoiling our brand. <laughs> Getting but, cheeky. But, but, that, but that said, what they are looking for um, um, on, on a real level is uh, somebody who can hold their hands with all the issues that they perceive that the um, country does have. And what I do, even though I'm in the middle guy, I also find a local partner to work with. Yeah. So even though I'm an outsider who looks like I'm an insider, I'm also working with local partners locally who help distribute the, the brand across the whole country. So yeah. it's just, you know, sometimes brands need that, I guess, UK or European feel to kind of make themselves feel comfortable rather than going straight in and not knowing who exactly locally they want to work with yeah. um, to then partner with. Now, uh, Terry, you mentioned, uh, you know, a few minutes ago that uh, when you said you were going to, you know, do, uh, going to do business in Africa, the few people were telling you that, you know, you, you must have gone mad. And, you know, what are they saying now? The success that you've had? Uh, they're saying maybe a little bit less mad and maybe you had a little <laughs> bit more foresight than, uh, than we thought. Um, but, you know, we're not finished yet. Um, yeah. Just the comment on the local partners, it's difficult when you're in long-term investment. Alignment of the international investors and the local ones is sometimes difficult. Um, so my preferred route is to, be and have, is to have very good local management and local people who are running the companies for us, okay. um, rather than local owners, um, which, as I say, in, 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 in our sector has worked, is tapping into different parts of the... Um, the local expertise, but that, that's the way that uh, I've preferred to do it. Yeah. And uh, one final question, how do we then uh, consolidate uh, um, all these uh, localized solutions that we have and make them fit into one global market? And uh, I guess, uh, Terry, you can take that question. 
Um, I don't think you need to try. I think the size of the opportunity in Africa, as we've collectively said, is, is enough for, um, frankly, anybody to get their teeth into. Um, and what you've heard, I think, collectively on the, on the stage here is people choosing um, their particular niches and their particular countries. And if you do that well, you know, sometimes you make mistakes. You know, I came out of a country, you've sold out of some of them. But there's so much opportunity that if you keep at going on what your, where your expertise is, then you can get great opportunity and great success. All right, Terry, one has come, I have three minutes left, uh, but just very, very quickly, this question is, uh, is for you and has come through. It says, Terry, the capital outlay for the kind of business that you do is very huge. How long is your payback period? Um, probably longer than my private equity shareholders would like. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this company that I'm in now, um, the private equity came in in 2011. So they've been in seven years. They're saying, come on, when are we going to get an exit? Um, so watch this space. All right. And final comments from Alex, and then we'll also take final comments from uh, Tara. So final comments from Alex, first of all. What would you like me to say? Uh, just <laughs> in general, just, you know. Um, oh, um, yeah. In general. Um, perhaps in regards yeah, to actually for taking sure. those yeah, you yeah. Know, localized solutions and then. In general, it into if you're born here and you have a great skill set, please, please, I'm begging you, go back home and use your skill set. You'll make far more money than you would if you stay here. That's very great coming from someone like him that has made it here. So if he's telling. I'm going back. <laughs> And Tara, um, is there any final thing you'd like to say? Any comments? I think some of the two things that you're going to hear about having uh, building a business in, in Africa is one of them is, um, is human capital, uh, challenges with, with skilled people to run the companies. And second thing you're going to have is, for example, in our space, is the retail space. Um, I always say that whatever that challenge is, there, there's opportunity. Okay, um, one of the things that we did at House of Tara was to realize that our work is beyond just doing a business, it's actually to educate our team. Um, and in educating the team and investing in them also is one of the reasons why recently House of Tara was listed the, one of the top 100 best companies to work for in Nigeria. That investment, <laughs> as much as someone will say to you, people are not educated enough, people are not skilled enough, we, we need to solve that problem because the social issue and the minute we go into business, we must realize that we're not just there to make money, we're also there to make social change. Thanks. Wow, I, I mean, I think that's a perfect way to end it, Tara. And that completely throws away that initial idea I had. I was only joking about the business. I was going to start in the UK. I'm going to do it back home in Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening. And thank you to my panelists. Uh, Tara, Alex, and Terry. It's such an honor. <laughs>